How's it going? Um, so you heard my really long subtitle. Uh, and the really amazing part about this subtitle, aside from its length, is that in the marketing material for this talk, we managed to publish like four different figures for how many versions we tested. Um, and they're actually, they're all lies. Um, even this one is a lie. We actually tested like maybe five with a bunch of different little versions. Uh, but that lie was explicitly engineered to get you in this room. And it looks like it worked. Um, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Let me make a couple introductions. Um, <laughs> I work at Etsy. Uh, you guys are at Etsy, uh, or you're watching an Etsy live stream. So I'm going to assume that you know a thing or two about that whole like e-commerce thing that we do. Um, my name is Geo, uh, or that long bit that you see up there. And during my tenure at Etsy, I've been focused uh, at first mostly on search. So I built stuff like local search, uh, favorite search. I worked on our indexing pipeline a lot. Um, and then after a long stint doing like infrastructure things, I had a yearning to do more product-focused work. Uh, so in the last year and a half, I've been focusing on the listing and shop pages. So back in like late 2012, uh, our favorite product man, uh, Frank, who's somewhere back there, um, came at me with this proposal. And he was like, dude, let's redesign the listing page. And I was like, you, you mean that page with the giant green button that everyone clicks to send us money, right? Um, and he, he was like, yeah. And I was like, oh, oh, OK, that's no big deal. And I asked my teammate, Andrew Morrison, who's a 12-year-old pink security guard, um, <laughs> what he thought. And he was like, dude, this is going to be awesome. Let's just rewrite everything. Um, and you know, I'll be honest. At first, I wasn't really sure this was a good idea. Uh, this kind of set off a couple alarms in my head. I asked some of my buddies, like Steve, um, <laughs> who you can see here being interviewed, because uh, he's a really smart dude. Um, and he was like, uh, are you sure that you really, really want to do this? Um, and you know, at most companies, like the, mon the monolithic redesign is just like a totally normal, like cool thing to do, right? Like iOS 7, like let's just change everything, fuck it, right? Um, but that's not really like the way that we do things at Etsy, right? Like our whole like way of operating is to making is making small measurable changes and iterating, right? And we do that because it helps us gain confidence that the changes that we're trying to make are are good ones, that they're having the effects that we intend for them to make. So this whole idea of redesigning the listing page felt like the antithesis of our whole our whole product process, um, and that process I thought was really well. Uh, explained by my teammate Dan. By the way, this is a picture of him giving a picture, uh, of him giving a talk in front of a picture of him giving a talk. Um, <laughs> and in this talk, he explained this sort of iterative process. And the way that he did it was he contrasted two product launches. He contrasted the removal of the search dropdown, which as you can tell is ancient history, so that product launch was a massive success. And this was a really long protocol made of iterative small changes. And he contrasted that with our effort to implement infinite scroll and search results. And it just so happens that I was the sole developer and that massive failure of a project to make infinite, uh, infinite search results. Um, and yet here I was again, being propositioned with an even more monolithic project on a more important page that was probably the most important page on Etsy. By all accounts, it was an irrefutably horrible idea. Everything inside my soul told me, this is just really, really dumb. Um, but I did it anyways. And the reason I did it, I think, was best summed up by something Frank said at a company all hands, probably a couple months into the process. Um, he said, you cannot iterate your way to fundamental change. So we can make these small measurable changes. We can inch our product forward. but..." What if what we're inching towards is this local maxima, right? What if there's this other whole possibility of what your product could be that you would never reach because you wouldn't be able to reach it in a reasonable time frame by making these small changes? You know, whether or not this fantasy is a reality, this is a, something that we all like sort of intrinsically think in our brains, right? Like that's why engineers want to just redesign and re-engineer everything, why designers just want to throw out the way everything looks. This is something that we want to do. So we we sort of thought to ourselves like you know, the monolithic redesign, it sucks. But could there be another way of pulling this thing off that gives us that same confidence that we're so used to in the way that we th do things at Etsy? So let's talk about what's wrong with the monolithic redesign. And I think it could be categorized really simple in, a, in, a, in three things. First, the monolithic redesign is characterized by a massive investment. The scope is huge. There's a lot of people involved, months of development. And that investment is, is sort of predicated 
on, or based rather, on some assumptions. And those assumptions almost always turn out to be wrong, right? It just so happens that we're super educated people, uh, designers, engineers, product managers, people that are at talks talking about product development. Um, we are almost always nothing like our users. They don't behave the way that we expect them to. And the, the UIs that we design just rarely sort of work out, or at least they rarely work out at first chance. But when they fail, the really shitty part about that monolithic redesign is that it's really hard to disambiguate the effects. So you've changed so many things that when nothing works, you don't know which of the four dozen changes that you made is most responsible for that failure. And then you sort of have to like throw your hands up in the air and you have nothing left to do, right? But what if instead of that, the universe, if you would imagine for a second, the universe of, pro of possible product changes was this giant multi-dimensional space. And what if instead of cutting a line through that space, we threw a couple darts. And each one of those darts would be super cheap They'd be orthogonal, so they'd be spread out in that space. They wouldn't be based on those same assumptions. They'd be super fundamentally different. And they'd be malleable. So we could sort of explore the space around those darts, maybe take some features from one idea and implement them in another or combine them together. Now, you know, that idea seemed pretty interesting to me. I was like, OK, I've spent my years on probably dumber things. Um, so why not? Let's give it a, let's give it a try. Um, and this talk is the story of putting that theory uh, into practice. And through that story, I hope to off also offer you some of the lessons that I've learned by being burned over and over again. Um, and I'm probably going to draw on some of the experiences that we're having trying to implement the same methodology on the shop page uh, this year. So we started off with a plan, uh, and it wasn't socialism. Um, and our plan was focused, first of all, on, on the fact that if you're working on products at Etsy, you're working with a loaded gun pointed at your head. And that gun is the holiday season. So we make about a third of our GMS uh, in the months of November and December. And so if you want to do anything interesting, you basically have to do it well ahead of this time. Not only because there's a lot of money at stake, uh, but also because we want to you know, have a really stable, sane situation for the sellers that are on Etsy at the busiest time of year for them. In our case, it was exacerbated by the fact that we were touching the core buying experience on Etsy, the listing page. And there are tons of other product teams that are trying to make changes to the page at the same time that we're trying to redesign it. So we knew that we wanted to be done well ahead, leaving them room to make their changes. So we aimed for the summer. We were like, we want to be done by then. Maybe we can get like five different iterations in. This is what each iteration roughly looked like. We would spend like maybe a week doing, or a week or two doing a design. Uh, and while Kim, our designer, uh, was working on what this looked like, um, I was usually doing analysis, like answering questions like, hey, how big are most listing images? Do people click on this button? Stuff like that. Um, we'd spend like a week developing. Um, we'd spend a week uh, with that iteration released to admin, uh, so just kind of dogfooding the experience and finding bugs. And then uh, we'd launch a public experiment to a small percentage of traffic uh, and see how it did. And usually that experiment took about one to two weeks. So this entire process probably took about a month to a month and a half for each iteration. Um, but that's like on average, right? Like the, the first couple iterations were way slower and the later ones were way faster. If you zoom out a bit, uh, one interesting thing you'll notice is that when we launched that public experiment, we didn't just sit around and wait for it to bake and get those results because we were on a tight schedule. So we knew we sort of had to like immediately start working on the next thing. So while that experiment was baking, we were usually working on the next design. Um, and that meant that that particular design couldn't learn anything about the previous iteration, right? We didn't have time to get those results and incorporate them and sort of iterate on them. Um, and I think that was actually like a blessing in disguise. It meant that really we had to try totally different things because we had no idea if the things that we tried the first time around were going to work the next time. Anyways, if I was going to take one you know, sort of lesson to draw from this. It's not to like make this plan or follow this plan or this is like the exact thing that I should do every time that I want to redesign a product. It's more like, hey, you should make time for failure. And what I mean by that is that you should set up the expectation with your team and your company that, hey, we're going to try a bunch of things and it's going to take some time and most of them are going to fail pretty, pretty horribly. So we set off uh, to build Henry and we named every iteration a different variant of the name Henry. Uh, and it wasn't after King Henry VIII. It was actually after my cousins, uh, who are uh, Henry and Enrique, and their brothers. Um, <laughs> and their father's named Enrique. Um, so we thought that was funny. And 
you know, we, we started working on the first iteration. This is what it looked like. Uh, we were really excited about it. This is Henry next to its predecessor. Uh, we didn't give its predecessor a name. I guess we should have given it a name. Um, but, you know, it felt really fresh. It felt really new. I'm not going to delve too deeply into the, des the design decisions uh, that were made. I think that's like a talk that Kim should probably give at some point, and you should, like, email her and encourage her to do that. Um, but, you know, we started, started working on this thing, and immediately there was a ton of things that we didn't change. We, we didn't change the data model. We didn't change the storage engine, the runtime language, the templating language. There was just like a long slew of things that we just sort of completely ignored. We built this thing the tried and true boring Etsy way because it worked and because we knew that if we were going to ship five versions of this thing, it's just not reasonable to completely re-architect your website, which is like su a surprising thing, right? Like half the time people just try to re-architect their entire product at the same time that they're redesigning it. Um, and frankly, I think that if you're going to to go down this monolithic redesign path, like you just can't manage to do new infrastructure. Um, and beyond the effect on your product plan, I actually think that attempting the infrastructure separately works out better when you're doing it in the context of an existing product, right? Um, it gives us a contract, which is something that engineers love. Um, so anyways, we, we went about fashioning this iteration, and one of the key sort of components of it was this buy box. Um, and the buy box was supposed to represent at a glance what were the important, the most important features of that particular listing. So you could write at a glance, like get an idea of what it is that this thing is. Um, and in the buy box, we, we, without even thinking about it, threw in this little feature where we showed you your currency. So we always showed you the price of the item in your currency, which in, uh, in hindsight feels super obvious, right? Um, but actually wasn't the case at Etsy at the time. Um, and we just did it without even thinking about it. And when we realized that the existing design didn't have this feature, we were like, hey, uh, why don't we just try this on the existing design and try an experiment there? And we did, and it did you know, really well, and we ended up shipping that. And I think people oftentimes don't realize that you can use the existing design and get some gains there um, while you're working on this monolithic redesign on the side. Uh, and we did this a number of times, and it turned out to be a fruitful strategy. So this is a listing title on Etsy. Uh, it's pretty awesome. They're really, really hard to parse because oftentimes people stuff them with terms to try to get to the top of the search results page. Um, so this is like a really giant drag for buyers. Um, the descriptions on Etsy are also a big drag. And we thought, hey, while we're working on this buy box, wouldn't it be awesome if we could make this really succinct sentence that described what the item was, like vintage sundress from the 1920s. And I, do, I, don't, I don't think they had sundresses in the 1920s. I think I just made that up. But um, in any case, we thought, like, hey, we have some idea about what these things are. Like, maybe we should give this a whirl, like programmatically generating these descriptions so that people had a better idea of what listings were and putting them right in the buy box. Um, and I said, cool, that seems like a reasonable idea. And I spent a couple hours on it, had a reasonable, you know, prototype. And then a week later, I was like knee deep in yak land, like unbelievably <laughs> deep in yak land. Um, you know, the key inputs into me generating the sentence was, you know, the category structure. And the category structure turned out to be, a, you know, designed by a gorilla in 1995. And it was just like absolutely absurd. It had like things like geekery and silver and materials and girl and boy. And it was just all nonsense. And, you know, at that point, this other lesson really sank in, which was that, you know, we shouldn't be making new features, right? We're working on reimagining what this thing is. And so rather than making new features, what we should do is make space for the new features that we're going to, you know, sort of create in the experience later on that the company's going to build on. Um, and I think the buy box was a great example of it, right? We ship, we carved out this space on the page, right? And we didn't spend a lot of time thinking about what the content was that we were going to put in there, but rather we just moved on and did the dumbest thing possible. And this doesn't just apply to to the design itself, we also try to do this in the code. So make it easy to just sort of like, hey, swap in a new generator for one of these bullets or do something differently uh, without having to totally rewrite this page. Um, and we did this in a number of different iterations uh, and a number of techniques. And I think it's been really fruitful for us. So anyways, we sent Henry off into the world. Um, like I said, we were super, super excited about it. Um, we thought it was going to do really well, and we didn't have to wait too long to get results. So this is a screenshot of our A-B analysis tool called uh, Catapult. Um, and it shows us the difference between the, con the control and the experiment. The right-hand side is the percent difference. Um, if you're having trouble parsing what's going on here, let me help you a little bit. Um, 
it was a massive failure. A failure on the scale of which I don't think I've ever witnessed. Like every single metric was absolutely horrible. Uh, and this was devastating. Like we really sincerely felt like this was an amazing step forward and it couldn't have gone any worse. And like the best part is like you look at this page and like damn this thing looks great, but like what could have possibly gone wrong? Is it like the fact that I put the favorites button like at the top right? Is it the fact that like this description now has this read more button? Did we like hide these like this other piece of merchandise too far down the page? Like there's 15 million things that could have gone wrong and I have no idea why it is that we're getting the result that we're getting. And so like this really dark feeling set in. Uh, I was thinking to myself like, Gio, you fucking asshole, you knew that this was gonna happen. Like, this is exactly what you knew was gonna happen. If you change everything on the page, you're never gonna be able to understand what the hell went wrong. Um, to be honest, I don't think I shook this feeling for, I don't know, maybe like three quarters of the way through this, this project. Um, but we made it through somehow, right? And the first way that we made it through was by trying to, to hone in on what, what the problems were. And we did that by, uh, first by using variants. So taking that design and trying to slice it and dice it and grab the features that we think are most important and most affecting that result and understanding what their impacts are. Um, now, one note of caution if you're going to use variants is that um, you're going to need to expose more of your traffic uh, to experimental treatments or you're gonna have to wait longer to get results. Um, and this is a website uh, our colleague Dan made called experimentcalculator.com. Um, you can plug in how many visits you have every day, uh, what the metrics that you're interested in looking at are, and it'll tell you how, how long to wait. In some cases, you won't be able to use variants because you don't have enough traffic or your metrics are just too rare. Um, but in any case, this was an option for us and we took it. We took a deep breath uh, and we fashioned a variant. We called him Henry II. Um, and it was focused mostly on shipping. So on the existing design, we shipping information showed up in this giant table, which is not giant, so giant in this case, but this table in the middle of the page, and we moved it all the way to the top of the page. And before, if I was trying to understand how much something would cost me, I would actually have to parse this table that's below all the listing information, find my location, and now instead of that, we're giving you this defaulted shipping price based on your browser's location right next to the buy button. And we knew from previous experiments that shipping is like a really, really big deal, because Amazon set like an incredible bar, right? We expect shipping to be free. We expect the thing to be on our doorstep the next day. Unfortunately, that's not the reality of the way that Etsy works right now because we have you know, tens of thousands of sellers all over the world and you know, shipping doesn't work that nicely. Um, so we knew shipping was a big deal um, and we knew that this had the potential to really be a big downer on our experiment. So we fashioned a variant that had absolutely no shipping. Um, and to be clear, this was never a shippable product. Like we would never purposefully obfuscate shipping because that's just like an unethical thing to do. Um, but we did it in an experiment because we had to learn whether or not this was the thing that was screwing up our experiments. We needed to understand the effects of that particular feature. So we shipped it. Did it work? Uh, not really. Uh, it didn't really change a whole lot. Uh, it made people cart things more, but when they got to the cart page and saw what the shipping looked like, they just left. Um, so that got us a little closer. We knew that shipping wasn't the problem. We knew that hiding shipping is probably not a good idea. That's a cool piece of information, but we didn't yet have a silver bullet. And unfortunately, we ran out of time. We knew that if we were going to you know, ship five of these things, we'd need to move on. So we moved on uh, to Enrique, uh, which was the next iteration. This is what Enrique looks like. Um, and I think that Enrique did a pretty cool job of, again, carving out space in the design for new content. And again, we did the dumbest thing possible uh, to you know, put related merchandise at the top and on the right-hand side of the page. Uh, and later on, one of our data scientists, Rob Hall, would you know, ship an experiment on similar modules uh, that would be a big win after the listing page uh, went live. And so that sort of redeemed the strategy, I think, a little bit. Um, so we released a number of variants of Enrique that are probably not super consequential in the history, but I think the important part is that suddenly things started looking positive. Uh, we didn't have to figure out what Henry, uh, what was wrong with Henry because we had this Enrique design that was suddenly revenue positive. Conversion rate was good, people weren't bouncing, awesome. Um, except not everything was so awesome. Um, so the, the item favorite rate was totally just not doing so hot. And at the same time, people were favoriting shops more. So 
uh, on the right-hand side of the page, you can favorite an item, and at the top of the page, you can favorite a shop. That shop favorite button used to be buried somewhere on the right-hand side, and now it's all the way at the top, super prominent, and as a user, you think, hey, if I'm gonna favorite something, I'm probably gonna do one or the other. The shop or the listing, I'm probably not gonna do both. So it makes sense that to a certain extent, the metrics that we were seeing indicated that we were cannibalizing item favorites, right? Like people were, rather than choosing item favorites, choosing shop favorites. Okay, that seems like a reasonable explanation, except the gains that we made in shop favorites in absolute terms didn't make up for the losses that we saw in listing favorites. So that wasn't the whole story, and we knew that from the get-go. Again, we sort of had to move on uh, to Hank. And we tried a couple fun things with Hank. Uh, we tried flipping the page uh, from one side to the other. That turned out not to make a, a big difference. Um, we also debuted uh, feedback, which would later become reviews. So at the time, we were working on revamping our feedback uh, system, which is you know, the system that you sort of like leave your impressions of the listing and of the, the shop on. Um, because we were working on that project, or another team was working on that project, signals of shop quality were really sort of keen uh, in our minds, and we thought it would have a big impact on the buying experience. Um, and you know, here we are breaking our own rules, right? shipping new features when we said to ourselves that we wouldn't. So we did what most people do when they break their own rules. We made rules about breaking the rules. Um, and so we said to ourselves, you know, if you're going to ship new features, let's at least test them independently. Um, and we, that, this would turn out to be a, a relatively big win. Um, but while we were fashioning this iteration, we also, um, we wanted to get to the heart of the matter uh, with the Enrique iteration. We, we decided, hey, you know, it's getting to be like May, we're getting a little closer to that ship date, and we have a design that may just be a winning design. Uh, but we have this issue of item favorites. We don't know what's going on. Let's try to take advantage of this iteration, not only to test some new things, but to try and like hone in on what could possibly be wrong. Um, so we took that idea about the shop header, and we decided, hey, this is our best guess as to what's going wrong with the item favorites. Let's try to just remove this thing entirely. Um, so we resurrected Enrique, we made a version of Enrique uh, that didn't have the header, uh, and we tested that against all the versions of Hank. And you might be saying to yourself, like, wait, you resurrected the experiment? Like, how did you do that? Did you just, like, revert a bunch of code? Um, and no, it turns out we didn't revert a bunch of code because one of, the, like, the few technically interesting things that we did was that we sandboxed all the iterations uh, in the experiment. And what I mean by that is that Every iteration had its own JS, its own CSS, its own template files, um, and they were sort of self-contained, right? So like the files inside one iteration didn't reference another iteration. Um, and that meant that we could easily sort of resurrect that particular experiment and bring it back to life. Now you might be asking yourself, like, what about the server side? Well, we're not building features, right? So the server side was more or less you know, stale since the beginning of the project and since that uh, initial push, um, which, is not really so true in practice. We made some changes, but we tried to make all those changes backwards compatible, precisely so we could do things like this. Um, by the way, another cool feature of doing, uh, of sandboxing iterations is that when you're creating a new iteration, you can just sort of like, hey, use a file copy to make a new version of the whole thing. Um, that turned out to be super useful. And then when you're done, you can just throw away a bunch of folders and keep the winning uh, experiment and you know, kind of put it in the right place. So anyways, we shipped a version of Enrique. We, with the header, without the header, tested them all together uh, and had a really surprising result. The shop favorites disappeared, but the listing favorite gains or losses didn't really move a whole lot. Uh, and that was surprising. Uh, we expected to see some effect there and we didn't see it at all. Uh, so this was like a big red flag, like what the hell's going on? Um, and again, we moved on. We moved on to Henrietta um, and Henrietta was a release candidate. It was focused on trying to hone in on what we had learned across all the previous experiments, make sort of a Frankenstein, but it was also deeply concerned with uh, fixing that favorite issue that we saw in Enrique, that we saw in Hank yet again, and we said, can we come up with a treatment that could fix this problem? So we pulled the favorites button down into its own module, made it really big, we put a giant counter uh, right next to it telling you how many, how many other people had favorited this thing, um, like we couldn't make this thing any bolder, right? Like if we made it any bolder, it would have completely overpowered the add to cart button, uh, which is obviously something that we don't want to do. So we sent that out to the world. We tested that guy out again. And 
lo and behold, it didn't work. Um, at this point, the existential crisis like hit like absolute rock bottom. I had no idea what I was going to do with myself. Uh, I considered packing up my bags and never doing this again. Um, and then, after a lot of digging, I wrote probably like dozens of analytics jobs. I can't tell you how many things I looked into. Someone was like, "Hey, isn't the signed out page like a little bit different?" And lo and behold, it was a little bit different. Uh, there was this like nag at the top of the page asking people if they liked this item and inviting them to hit the favorite button. And it turns out this was like one of our first A-B experiments back in 2011, and it was engineered specifically to try to get more people to register, right? You give them a call to action that they might be interested in, they click the button, go through the registration flow, and boom, they're part of, they're a member and they favorite the thing. Um, in retrospect, this should have been really obvious that this was a problem because uh, while we were dropping the favorite rate, we were also dropping the registration rate. So it's very likely that those two things were correlated. Of course, you know, that's not all, hindsight is 2020, right? So we fashioned uh, a nag that looks more or less the same thing as the existing one. We shipped it and it won. And I think that, you know, always check the signed out state is not like, you know, the thing that you should take away from this. <laughs> it, it's, it's that, there are so many things that go wrong that can go wrong in your experiment. They rarely ever go the way that you expect them to go, um, and you really just need to be prepared to dig into them. And I see tons and tons of experiments, dozens over the last four years, where we get a failure. The failure isn't easily explicable with the tools that we have, and then we just walk away from it. Um, and sure, it's good to walk away from bad ideas, but like we're throwing away so much potential every time that we do that. And you really need to be prepared to dig in. A lot of times, that's not just a matter of writing good analytics jobs. A lot of times, it's a matter of just having good domain knowledge and good intuitions for the way that people behave or the sorts of problems that you might have. Um, one technique that's been particularly useful for us is segmentation. Um, and what I mean by that is taking uh, the population of people that you've exposed to your experiment and seeing how different subpopulations are affected. So like say people uh, in Russia versus people in the United States, taking a look at signed out users versus signed in users, um, and using that to try and understand what's wrong with your experiment. So my favorite example of using segmentation um, is from the shop redesign project, which we're doing right now, um, and is obviously related to the listing redesign project. Um, and it starts off with this, this design, um, it's called John. All these guys are named after John. Uh, and when we released John, we were again really excited about it and actually did really, really well. But one thing that did really poorly was the bounce rate. So a bounce is when a user arrives on your website, they see one page and they leave. So the problem with debugging bounce rates is that it's not like favorites, it's not like add to cart, it's not like these other call to actions that have a giant button. Like I can't just move a button around and make it bigger or hide it. Like there's no easy treatment because there's so many things that could go wrong with bounces. Um, so we thought, well, let's try and slice and dice this experiment uh, and figure out what's wrong. Like, is it browsers? Uh, you know, like, did we break IE7? Well, no, that turned out not to be the case. Uh, is it performance, right? If we're hitting a slow page, people are likely to not stick around because slow experiences suck. Um, it turns out that performance is an interesting one because we actually don't have uh, like globally collected client-side performance metrics that we can slice and dice by AB. Um, so we said, hey, maybe we can look at things based on the country that someone's in because that's a good proxy for client-side performance because you know, the farther you are from the data center, the more you know, latent your connection, and the more likely that you're experiencing these sorts of, uh, sort of uh, client-side slowness. Um, and the benefit, uh, another benefit of looking at things based on country is that if you have like translation issues or if you have like buttons that are overflowing, you'll probably see that the international community is, uh, is being way disproportionately affected by the experiment. So we looked at it this way. Um, and that turned out to be a big negative. And so yet again, we found ourselves like in a deep, deep conundrum. And like, I don't know if you're noticing a trend here, but like, there, they, this always feels horrible and it is always a deep investigation and it never feels totally resolved until you find that aha thing. Um, and, and so we started thinking about this page and we said, you know, like this is the sunny day version of this design, right? Like it's absolutely beautiful, you know, this is a great looking shop, this is the best that this page could ever look. But what about the edge cases, right? What about the cases when there's not that many listings, when someone doesn't have reviews, maybe they don't have a location, like, Maybe users in those different segments are, or users that visit shops in those different segments are doing worse. And we found something really interesting. Um, we found that the empty shop experience was really, really 
uh, disproportionately affected by the bounce rates, or rather the, the bounce rate was disproportionately bad for empty shops, which is kind of mind-boggling, because like, look at the, 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 the experiment versus the control. Right? This, this is totally confusing. Like, What is going on here? It's basically just a blank page, and at the top, we've actually given the user some indication of what's going on. So why, why would the control be doing any better? Um, what are people doing? So we decided to actually look at some of the visits, some of the cases when people were arriving on an empty shop and, and doing something else on Etsy and not bouncing. Uh, and what we found was actually pretty interesting. Uh, they were refreshing the page. And when you look at the experience, it's pretty obvious, right? Like, you get this blank page, and it's like, oh, something's probably super wrong, so let me just refresh it. And so suddenly, they've done another thing on your website, and so they don't count as a bounce, right? Uh, which is awesome. Uh, so like, <laughs> the bounce rate was basically like a massive lie. And what we did to, to sort of hone in on that was we decided, like, let's make a new definition of bounce, and let's call it a refresh bounce. Uh, so a refresh bounce is either you, arri you arrived and left, or you arrived and refreshed the page a bunch of times and left. And when we, when we measured that, the experiment was actually doing better than the control. Um, so you know, I don't think we ever would have gone down to the bottom of this if we hadn't have segmented it, right? Like there wasn't a single variant we could have released that would have like gotten to the bottom of this particular problem. The one like gotcha I'm gonna say about segmentation is check your p-values. Um, I had like a whole set of slides where I delved into like this crash course on statistics, and I decided that was like a bad call half an hour into a talk. Um, but we have a team of analysts that are in the back of the room that would be excited to talk to you about it. Um, I'm sorry if I enlisted you without you uh, realizing it. Um, so at the end of the day, we we ended up shipping the the listing page. Uh, we shipped something very close to Henrietta, and there was tons of other stuff that we did, tons of other people that I've done no justice in this process. Um, but uh, it was very successful. Uh, this is like the success graph, right? Like this is what you want in an experiment. I have a tattoo of it on my bum. Um, and you know, the, I hope that you've taken from this talk today that you know, successfully launching a redesign in a way that you can build confidence or doing this in a way that you can build confidence is feasible, but it's really a matter of like honing in on these three things. And you know, these are principles that I think can apply to product development in general. Like just about anything that you're building, you could take this, take this to heart on. But they're acutely important when you're doing a redesign because the redesign sort of explodes each of these, uh, each of these problem spaces. So if you're not very disciplined about it, it can easily overwhelm you. Um, and then one final note of caution um, that I'm gonna throw out there is that I think that there's a time and a place for everything. Uh, and what I mean by that is that I wouldn't try this sort of like throwing a couple darts out there over the course of time um, on experiences that have tons and tons of variables, right? Like I would do it on the listing page, I would do it on the shop page or on your home page, but I probably wouldn't do it on search. I probably wouldn't do it on like really interactive experiences, because in those experiences, there's probably too many variables for it to be like at all tenable. Um, so that's it. Um, and I'll take questions. Also, we're hiring. Cool. <laughs> Uh, so the question was, uh, so everyone can hear it, uh, would it be a good idea to test all these things against each other at the same time? Um, and uh, assuming that you have enough traffic to do that sort of thing, uh, that's a great idea. And that's you know probably the only way that you can gain confidence that one is really better than the other. Uh, and in fact, we did that, right? We tested versions of Hank against versions of Enrique. Um, of course, we never had to bring some of the older ones into play because we knew they failed miserably. Um, I think the real question is whether or not you have enough traffic to pull that off, um, and whether or not you have are looking at metrics that that appear frequently enough for for you to pull that off. But also keep in mind, like, if they're really cheap and you can do that, yeah, maybe. But they're never that cheap. Yeah, so the question was, you know, why did we get caught up on the like metric? Um, 
we got caught up on the like metric because uh, we think it's a, a pretty uh, important signal of positive engagement. Uh, we use it to, for things like recommender systems, uh, for activity, et cetera. But beyond that, I will say that we actually, we found ourselves in a position where we were about to ship, right? Like in the midst of that existential crisis, we had a deadline looming. Um, and we said to ourselves, like, what is the worst case scenario? How much does the favor really mean to us? And we put a dollar value on it. And, you know, we, we made the decision that even if we couldn't figure that out, we probably would have shipped anyways. It would have been a bummer, but we knew how much we were losing uh, because we had run the experiments, and we therefore had the knowledge and confidence to possibly ship without it. Right. Uh, so the question was, how did can, can I talk about the ideation process um, and how there was, you know, tons of different people with different ideas, um, and I think that what we what we tried to do and at that time again this is probably like a really good question for Kim who was heading the design process, um, but I'll I'll try to extrapolate a little bit based on what we're doing with the shop shop process right now. I think that we tr sort of are right now actually trying to frame each iteration a little bit, like here are some of the key ideas that we want to explore or key areas that we want to explore with this iteration. Um, and of course, that's more than you would change if you were making small incremental changes. I think framing that discussion helps a lot. Um, and I think, uh, personally, I find that I don't think it's super useful to have like 40 people in a room uh, like arguing about what should be done. We sort of like, hey, frame the discussion with these are the sorts of things that, we, that we're interested in exploring now. We have like our product managers and designers going out to different like stakeholders and you know, seeing how they feel about those ideas and sort of gathering that and then I guess like really focusing the discussion is the way that we, we handle that. Right, and so the question was, how willing were we during the redesign to step away from the style guide? Again, another great question for our designers uh, who are in the back of the room and would love to talk to you. Um, I will say that in general, we will try to use a pattern when one exists and we'll you know, only do something completely new when we have to, right? Like, the pattern doesn't have to be new for the feature and the experience to be new. Uh, and we reuse tons of existing stuff. And we did make some new stuff, um, but yeah, there's a balance to be struck there, definitely. And I think any time that you're going to introduce a new pattern, like you're blowing up the con like the design context of your site, and like you need to like you know think about that a little deeply and consider it seriously and make a case for it. Um, but also, we're running experiments, right? So it's okay to like do something slightly different, and maybe it'll fail. That's fine. But it's a spectrum. So on. The listing page uh, project last year, we didn't touch the mobile site. We planned on it, and we ran out of time. Um, this year, when we're working on shop, we are doing both the mobile and desktop uh, designs at the same time. Uh, they're technically speaking different experiments, and we're sort of designing them a little bit differently. Um, but I think we're hoping on sort of testing similar themes at the same time, so we can sort of end up with, with two designs that mesh well together. Um, but this is very much a new thing for us. Um, and at the time, wasn't the core focus of that that particular project. So the question was, how do we coordinate different teams doing different experiments? So, what what basically happened with the listing page is that while we were doing this this really experimental phase, everyone had to basically ignore our experiment. So if you can imagine our experimental setup as an if-else, right? Like if new listing page, if you're bucketed in here, uh, otherwise do this other thing. Everyone else went in the else branch, right? So they only experimented on the existing page and assumed that our entire project plan would be screwed and would never ship. Um, and then like maybe like three or four months later when we had some idea that we, we had like a thing that could ship, um, we started asking people to port their features over to the new one. Um, and yeah, so for a while some features existed in both spots, for a while they only existed in one spot. Um, like I said, that's actually a really tough problem and why we put so much pressure on ourselves to sort of ship this thing in a reasonable time frame.
sorry, I can't hear you. Um, so when we open it up to everyone, so I'm not really sure. So we never like tested it for a few months at a time. We went from testing it for two weeks at a time with like one to two percent of traffic to at the very end when we had certainty that you know we had significance and we we felt confident that all the metrics were looking good. We tested it at like you know 25, 50 percent uh, for maybe like two weeks, and at that point, you know there that's pretty unquestionable whether or not we're having a, a good or negative effect. Um, and, you know, they, they were on par with what we expected. That's a really interesting question. So the question was, how do we integrate user research? User research is actually something that's really new for us. Um, when we were doing the listing page product, I think we did like two or three usertesting.com videos. Uh, there was like one Jamaican dude that sounded really baked. Um, <laughs> It was, you know, we, we didn't have the resources to do it at that time, um, but we now have this huge user research team full of people that are like amazing experts and really cool people to talk to. Um, and we've done a couple user research sessions and we sort of use it to like supplement uh, and guide the ideation a little bit um, and get more qualitative feedback. So um, I wouldn't say it's like a part of the timeline, but we do them all the time to try and you know see how people feel about the new things. And when we have questions about particular areas that you know we we don't feel strongly about, uh, we we definitely go there, especially for the things like you know like the identity of the shop, like how does this make you you know like what feels right to you, like th th those sorts of things I think are really useful to explore in that context. Um, so the question was, why, why wouldn't I do this on the search page? Uh, I think because just looking at the examples that I talked about today and thinking about the mental anguish that I endured um, on such simple pages because it's so hard, to, so many things can go wrong on seemingly really simple pages um, that when you add up so many other variables, I feel like it's gonna be really, really difficult. Uh, to understand what's going wrong. And like in search, when we run experiments that make the tiniest of changes, like understanding the ramifications of that, we're, we're probably still not even great at because there's such a universe of experience that people get based on the queries, based on you know, what facets they click on, based on what their location is, that you know, it really, really takes like some expert um, like uh, analytics to be able to, to dig into those experiences. And if you change everything, it's just like, it's just untenable, I think. Um, I don't think so. Uh, so the question was, you know, based on the experience that I have now, if I went back, would I add a lot more time to doing analysis? Um, I think the tricky part about analysis is that everyone should be doing it, we should be doing more of it, but it's really easy to do too much of it and sort of like go down a completely dark hole. And I really loved the forcing function. Like I really loved the, the idea that like, hey, I got as far as I could got with this answer and we got to keep moving. And then like as, as the project progressed, we were able to like sort of hone in on those questions. Um, but I've definitely found myself in situations before where like I spent two weeks on a thing and I'll like come out from this hole and it's like, wait, what was I doing again? You know, like it's, it's kind of nice. Any more questions? Uh, so the question is, how much does Etsy rely on SEO and how much did that factor into our design, design decisions? Um, so Etsy, SEO is definitely a big deal for us, right? Google's a, a huge referrer. Uh, at the time, we didn't really have an SEO team again. Uh, we have a lot of people that are dedicated and thinking about that now. Um, it wasn't a huge part of our design process. I think it's a bigger part now that we're sort of focused on, on making changes that are SEO friendly. Um, that's probably due to my incompetence and the lack of like you know expertise in the area that uh, that most of us had. But it's definitely a, a piece of of the shop redesign page. It's a piece of other experiments that we're thinking about right now.
So the question is, why did Etsy have one person working on something so important? Um, uh, <laughs> uh, so the, the project actually started off with two developers. It was me and Andrew Morrison that was right, out, right over there. Um, but we actually parted ways, and he focused on the reviews uh, project, and I focused on the listing page. Um, I think in general, we tend to have really small development teams, and I don't, I don't think it takes big teams to accomplish a lot. I think that more often than not, it just adds more noise to the project, you know, to the, to the project. Um, I, you know, I, I think that we've, we've got a bunch of people that are really awesome, and we have that, the benefit of being able to trust them to do awesome things, uh, and that feels great. And we also, like, make sure that we're on track, right? Like, there were pretty clear milestones along the way. Um, we had a, a clear vision, and I feel like that helped us gain confidence that we didn't need more people. I think if, if we had felt overwhelmed technically, maybe we would have added more people. Um, but again, in general, I don't, you know, like most of the big product, products that we've ever shipped, you know, had at most like two developers or something. Um, so, and in terms of the rest of the team, it was one product manager and one designer. Uh, and then later on in the project, when we were closer to shipping, we brought in tons of other people, uh, like marketing and communications people, uh, as that phase in the project uh, came to, f to fruition. But for most, of the for most of the project, it was really just three people. How did you uh, test the difference between usability issues and UX versus relevancy and performance? So the question is, how would you how would you test the difference between uh, the usability of the UX and the content that you're showing on the page? And I think the the answer there is uh, it's pretty close to what we did, which is you just test them independently, right? Like in in the course of these experiments, we actually spent very little time focusing on the algorithms that would be generating content. We just sort of like tested uh, the designs for them, and then later on, we let teams that are really hyper focused on that sort of thing, like our data science team, like hone in on that. Uh, and test different algorithms for content. Um, and you know, in the past, we've mixed these things up, and we've mixed these things up in the context of like monolithic redesigns. It took like six months and involved 15 people, and like that almost always turns out to be a horrible idea. At what point do you realize it's not the UX? It's something else. Um, it's a good question. Uh, I feel like if you're certainly moving things around on the page all the time and there's nothing happening, it's almost certainly your content. Um, in my experience, it's been the case that like really obvious design changes have like monumental impacts on metrics. Um, so, you know, design's a big deal. That's it. So the question is, do we monetize the impact of our changes, and how far do we project? Um, we definitely monetize. We had a goat metric for a while. We, we, uh, our team really liked eating animals, um, it turns out. And so we would like measure how many goats we would win uh, with a particular project. Um, I don't think we do that so much anymore. Um, now we're sort of getting into the, into the, f the, the mentality of trying to think about how we're impacting the global conversion rate or the global rate of some activity across the entire site just because it lets us um, measure one project against another uh, on a reasonable scale. Um, and w I don't think we do that any farther than the year. Yeah. Are you optimizing conversion rate? Oh, yeah. We're, we're, so the buyer-facing teams are usually optimizing conversion, um, but you know, different projects will optimize different things. I think everyone's interested in seeing tons of different activity uh, improve on Etsy. Uh, and if you make a reasonable case for why we should care about something, I think a lot of people will be open to hearing about that. So the question is, do we have any experience with how redesigns affect people that read right to left instead of left to right? Uh, we don't. Um, I don't know if we actually currently support any languages uh, that are right to left. We, I c we might, but yeah. We, we don't have a lot of experience with that. Can you 
Sure. So the question was, can I say a little bit about how sellers felt about uh, this whole process? And that, that's honestly something I didn't touch on in my talk because it was like really you know, product focused. Um, but it's an interesting question because there's like at the other end of these experiments, there's tons of humans whose lives are at stake. Um, the, we don't really publicly talk about our experiments until we're at a point where we think that we can release this thing. Um, and, but despite that, we were like watching what was happening in the forums. Uh, and people were definitely really upset at first. Um, they, you know, people will get upset when you change things. That's just like the way things are. Um, but they obviously had particular pain points. And even though we didn't talk about them, a lot of times we actually like incorporated that feedback into some of our designs. Um, towards the end, we made a lot of decisions to try to, you know, uh, smooth the design out for them um, or make some things a little bit less aggressive uh, so it would reduce the impact on sellers. Um, we also, after we had our winning design, after we had tested it at a high percentage, we announced that this change was coming. We gave users like uh, over a month maybe uh, of time uh, before that change was live and we let people preview what it would look like. Um, and I think that coupled with being in the forums and really talking about it as we were approaching the final launch uh, helped it be probably one of the communications wise most successful launches that we've ever had. Um, yeah, and I think right now during the shop uh, redesign experience, it's actually been remarkably positive uh, for once. Um, and people seem to be really liking the fact and they're sort of getting into the, our users are actually getting used to the fact to some extent that we're running experiments and they're excited about things changing, which is nice to see. Right. So the question is, um, so you know, we probably made some adjustments to the design to try and make sellers feel a little bit better as we we're getting closer to the release. And you know, how do we know whether or not these were real things or whether you know they had any like tangible impacts? I mean, we tested the changes that we were going to make, so we knew whether or not they made any impacts. Uh, I will say that a lot of the things the sellers were concerned about were were just not true. Uh, one of my favorite things, actually, this is a really positive thing, but everyone was like, I hate I hate this design, but I really love the bigger pictures. Um, the pictures were the same size. Um, uh, so like, there's like so many amazing things like that where like people hone in on things that they think are really important and like they're often not. Um, some things that they, they, they were important, um, the image gallery, uh, we tested some versions of the image gallery that had those little circles like the, the, the sort of iOS metaphor that everyone's used to. We really loved it, um, but the sellers hated it. They thought that people wouldn't be clicking on photos. We tested a version that had the little thumbnails. It did, and it did, you know, way better. So like, they were actually like completely on point. Um, yeah. So communicating is hard. Um, we don't, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> We, surprise, surprise. Uh, we, we don't want to talk about the experiments publicly because it could sort of skew what's happening in the experiment, but we like take into account what they're saying. Um, and then later on, when we have an idea that this is a thing that we're gonna do, then we have like an open dialogue about it. I would, I would say like the, the takeaway for me is that just that like, you know, a lot of times users gripe about things that aren't real or really important. That's like 90% of the time, but some of the time they do gripe about things. Uh, the other thing I felt like I learned as an engineer is probably that like, you know, sometimes it's worth caving a little bit um, to make that product launch, product launch a little bit smoother, right? Like, yeah, just like smooth them, you know. That was, that was terrible. Smooth them. Um, so the question is, were there, were there any ex uh, external factors? Um, so the question is, were there any external factors that sort of screwed our experiments? Um, no, thankfully. Um, also, if there were external factors, I would, affect, I would ex expect them to affect the control in the experiment uh, equally. So they shouldn't really throw off our process. Um, there are certainly like external things that could happen that may be biased in some way uh, that could affect one side of the experiment or the other, but we haven't really seen that a whole lot.
Yeah. Is there any other like interesting takeaways from that chat that you did? No, that was basically it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so the question was, did yeah. Uh, the question was, did we learn anything interesting from flipping the orientation of the page? Uh, other than that doesn't really change anything. No, no. People re acclimated it to, to it really quickly, actually. Like, we individually, like, when, when we first, like, uh, released it internally, everyone was like, whoa. And then, like, 30 seconds later, they were totally okay with it. And when we turned it off, people were like, wait, what? You know, like, they just, it's just kind of, it's really surprising how quickly you get used to it. What was the role of the product manager? Uh, look, at, look at Frank just shaking his head. He's just like, no, I, I can't, yeah, he can't even begin to express what he does. Um, if I had to, you know, I can't explain what Frank does. He just, <laughs> he makes my life work. That's really, like, I came into work and I didn't have to worry about a thing. He just made my life amazing. Uh, that's, that's really what he did. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, l to give you some idea, I, th I think that he, I think Frank was really good at keeping us on track, uh, asking the hard questions, asking us what were the important things for us to accomplish, uh, having the th three million conversations that he probably had with everyone without having to involve me, um, and, and just sort of making sure that the entire company was on track. And I think as we got closer to a launch, I think that became even more important, right? Like there's so many people involved and making sure that everyone's on the same page and that like we can actually do this thing is a really, really unbelievably hard job. Um, I would certainly never do it. Um, and I thank, I thank the gods that there are people like Frank in the universe. Um, So the question is, do we do these types of experiments on the seller side? So I th we've done some experiments on the seller side, but generally this is a, a situation that a lot of people find themselves in where like there isn't enough traffic or a lot of the things that we're interested in sellers doing just happen too rarely for us to run experiments on. So in that context, we actually have like a fairly different way of doing things. I think more often than not that we release sort of like uh, new concepts as prototypes that people can opt into and sort of get like qualitative feedback from people. Um, because that's just the way that we have to do it in that universe. Is there a way uh, to judge whether or not there's enough traffic to do the thing that you, to run the experiment that you want to run? So I'm just going to like go all the way back here and plug Dan's website again. Um, sorry, this is like really far back. Um, God, there's so, oh, there we go. ExperimentCalculator.com. So you can put in the number of visits that you have, the conversion rate, or what the rate of whatever metric you're interested in, how much traffic you want to expose, and it'll tell you how long to wait. Say that again. Right, so the question is, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to rephrase it for you, is how do we bucket people for experiments? Do we bucket shops, uh, individual shops, or do we bucket individual people? And so because this is a buyer-facing change, and what we're interested in is how our experiments change buyers, what we do is bucket the individual user that's seeing the, the page. Um, and if we were testing features about shops, uh, like you know, adding some new type of listing that they could, you know, add to their shop or something like that. We may be tempted to bucket on shop, but you're right that this is like a very sort of complicated problem and there's a chicken and egg between the two, right? Like when you run a rollout or new feature that depends on new functionality for sellers, but it will be exposed for, for buyers in a different way, that becomes super tricky. Um, and we've screwed it up like four dozen times. Um, I'd say the, the, the most effective strategy for dealing with that is sort of rolling out the seller site feature with prototype groups, getting feedback from them, sort of building the intuition that this is where we're going to go eventually on the, on the buyer side, but we may not get the treatment right right now, um, and collect that new information or sort of get sellers all using this new project or, or product, uh, and then eventually do more of an A-B experiment on the buyer side. 
Okay, so looks like we're, we've run out of time, uh, but I can stick around and chat if you guys want to. And here's Mary again. Thank you, Gio, so much.